as you make your way to us. We bless your name and we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the truth that abides in your word. And we'll praise your name for all you accomplish in this day through us. Amen. Amen. So, um, a few weeks back, I was home alone. And I was just by myself. It occurred to me, it was in the, an afternoon, and Walt was out of the house. My partner Walt was gone, and all my neighbors were at work. And I just fell into one of those housekeeping grooves. Have you ever had that happen? You just get into the groove, right? And when I get into the groove, a certain kind of thing happens because it's always accompanied with music. There's always music involved. And you get just the right combination of stereo and solitude at just the right volume which is always louder than it would be if anybody else was in the house to tell you to turn that racket down, right? I had all of that going, and I was in the kitchen, and I was bopping around, and I was scrubbing things and pulling things out, and a song came on that just caught my attention. It was from the remake of A Star Is Born, and if you've seen the movie, you'll probably remember the song, because it surfaces fairly early in the picture, when Bradley Cooper's character sort of wanders into this drag club, and one of the queens asks him to sing while they, they close up shop. Now, in the movie, I understood what was going on there, because it's there to comment on how times have changed. Not even five years ago or ten years ago would even be thinkable that we would have a movie with a country rocker hanging out in a drag bar. So that right there will let you know how much times have changed. But it was also meant to let us know that this character is weary with his own life. And he gets up, and while they're all scooting around cleaning up the bar, he picks up a guitar, and Cooper gives this husky rendition of a song and has a little bit of a tang of a cowboy lament. And he says, maybe it's time we let the old ways die. Maybe it's time we let the old ways die. It just takes a lot to change your plans. It's like he's having this conversation inside himself. It's time to let the old ways die. But it takes a lot to change your plans. It's a drain to change your mind. Hmm, maybe it's time to let the old ways die. It does take a lot for us to change our minds. This songwriter is spot on about that. It's a huge drain to think in new ways. It's just so much easier to ignore newness as it springs up around us. It's so much more comfortable to believe the myth that the more things change, the more they stay the same. So much easier to do that than invite the kinds of challenges that come from contemplating whether or not it's time to let some of those weary notions go. The same kind of questioning courses through today's text. The readings ring with two voices calling from opposite ends of the biblical timeline. One at the close of Judaism's prophetic era, and the other at the start of a new era that will give rise to a new faith that will come to be known as Christianity. And both messengers speak to people who are struggling with profound traumatic stress and loss. Malachi is written not long after the Babylonian exile. These people have spent a century in watching their, their country just ravaged by war. Their capital has been destroyed. Their temple taken all the way down to the ground. Their best and brightest picked up and moved to serve a foreign power. And now they've come back and they're trying to rebuild this. John the Baptist emerges under the full weight of Roman oppression. There is no peace in these times. In both cases, these messengers underscore tensions that have perennially thwarted Israel's attempt to have a relationship with God. The judgments that come down in their messages echo through the chambers of history in one prophetic text after another, in one psalm after another. They were sort of boiled down to faithfulness. You have undercut true faithfulness with false piety, the prophets say. You have replaced genuine worship with half-hearted ritual. You're, you're not paying attention to what pleases me. And so consequently, the message goes to repentance, turning away from harmful ideas and unhealthy habits, casting off unnecessary encumbrances, in short, letting unhealthy 
ways die. So maybe it's time. Maybe it's time. We know very little about this writer who's called Malachi, and many scholars suspect that he or she is writing under an assumed name because Malachi in Hebrew means my messenger. We also don't know exactly when the book is written, but there are enough references to let us know that this prophet is responding to what's happening in the land of Israel after the temple has been reconstructed. Now that everyone has returned from Babylon and the temple has been rebuilt and Jerusalem is a shining city resting on the rubble of its former self, now that this grand restart button <coughs> can be pushed, it would make sense to reevaluate the old ways and traditions and practices, to determine what should be kept and what should be let go. It would make sense to take stock of what would work now, now that we've been through all that we've been through, versus what we've always done. But that step sort of just gets skipped over. And so when it seems like the folks may have done a fabulous job of rebuilding the temple, but they've done kind of a bad job of rebuilding themselves. So beginning with verse 1, this anonymous writer just goes off. If you came this morning looking for comfort and cheer, you will not find it in Malachi. I'm warning you right now. The prophet says, your sacrifices are faulty. Your offerings pollute the air. Your attitude stinks. I mean, they actually say this. Your attitude stinks. You go through the motions of worship, but your boredom cannot be concealed. Oh, my goodness. I'm just not going to say it, but you know what I'm thinking. I'm content to take you to churches where this would apply right now today. Not Pilgrim, but right now today. Amen? Amen. Your rebellion leads others astray. You're just too dull to discern how much your apathy infuriates your maker. Your priests are deaf and their children are doomed. And y'all, that's just a sketch of what happens in the first two chapters of this prophecy. There is no peace. Everything's in place. They've got everything that they've lost has been returned to them. But there is no peace. Now I believe there is something for us in this word because it invites us to home in on some questions that we might not ordinarily ask. How often do we resist change simply because we're afraid of where it may be? Lead. We assume that reluctance to change will keep us safe and out of harm's way, when quite often the opposite is true. Families fall, I know I've got some family therapists in here, families fall apart every day because one or more of their members cannot let the old ways die. Corporations slide off into oblivion because their executives will not respond to changing markets and consumer tastes. Amen? Governments will falter because people in power will not change their ways. They will back corrupt regimes and tell lies in open court just to hold on to their power. <laughs> Churches that once were towers of justice and strength and service and mercy collapse under the weight of members who are so afraid of anything new that nothing happens inside them. After all the hard work that these folks did to get their temple back and their way of life restored, they were too afraid to let the old ways die. The very problems that made them vulnerable to attack in the first place just moved right back in with them when they got into their new digs. And look, I get it. We get it. Changing is a scary thing. Letting old ways die can be terrifying, even when it makes sense. And Malachi gets it, too. After pointing out that Israel hasn't recognized the scale of its problems, the prophet hastens to assure them that help is on the way. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. I love that about this prophet. He or she, and I'm prone to think that Malachi, Malachi, Malachi might be a she. I'm really going to say that because as I'm reading it, Malachi just sort of puts it right there and says, this is how it's going to be. Maybe it says something about me and my mom. I don't know. But my dad, you could 
play with, but my mama, this is how it's going to be. <laughs> I love that Malachi won't be content to criticize and condemn. She is not interested in being a pundit or launching into polemic. She knows her work isn't done until a ray of hope breaks through what she's got to tell these people. And this light shines up in this promise. I'm sending someone to your aid. Your help will come suddenly and things will start happening. A refining process is about to begin to change your story. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's time. Or maybe not. When I was in school and I took the prophets, my professor, the great and marvelous rabbi Rachel Mikvah, her opening sentence to us was, we're going to study the prophets, but I need to tell you something right now. Spoiler alert, they never changed anything. Because it takes the people to make the change. You can have the best preachers and the best prophets and the best teachers in the world, but until the people decide to change, nothing is moving. So we flash forward 500 years to Luke's gospel, and the situation looks eerily familiar. Before the writer even gets John the Baptist on the stage, he kind of sketches out an org chart for us to see what the conditions are, right? There's Caesar at the top, and then you got the number two guy, the henchman, Pilate, he's in place. Then you got these puppet kings who are all taxing their people because they're trying to impress the big boss in Rome. And then interestingly enough, right underneath them, you've got these two prophets, Annas and Caiaphas. What are they doing in this list? What are they doing in this list? Luke doesn't even have to tell us. We know what's going on. We see all kinds of things. We see all kinds of conspiracies and collusion and all those other words we're hearing a lot lately. We know that this is what's going on. And now here's the cool part, though. While the ink dries on the order chart, Luke just takes our focus and turns it out. He says, so what? You got all that political and religious mess going on in Jerusalem. The real story isn't happening out in Jerusalem. The real story is out in the boonies, y'all. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. In the wilderness. It's about as far as you can get from the seats of power. And we have to ask, what is John doing in the wilderness? Because he doesn't belong out there. He does not belong in the wilderness. We've got this image of it, but that's not where he belongs because he's the son of a priest. And back in ancient Israel, the sons of priests became priests. Priesting was a family business. John's supposed to be in Jerusalem. John's supposed to be learning his trade. John's supposed to be serving the congregation. And instead, he's holding open air church out on the River Jordan. Now, why would he do this? John's distance from the temple is a big deal because the old ways are dead to him. What's happening on this riverbank, however, is gloriously alive. And it's, well, it's kind of strange what's going on out there. It is. I just don't know how many of us would just get in our station wagons and drive out there to see what was going on. Because it's a little weird. And the lectionary today kind of does, a, does us a tactful favor. It just closes with this beautiful passage from Isaiah, doesn't it? It's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. We just hear, don't you hear Handel in the back of your mind? <laughs> Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the deserts a highway for our God. Is the way God puts it right. Every valley will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be made low. And the crooked will be made straight. And the rough will be made smooth. And all flesh will see the salvation of God. But if you read on, and do this when you get home this afternoon, read on, things get really weird. John behaves more like a crazed prophet than a kind priest. He, he gathers all these people around him and then he calls them vipers. You vipers, don't you know what's going on? And he says, if you don't get your act together, you're going to be cut down like sterile trees and thrown into, you know, thrown into the fire. And you wonder, what are these people doing? If John preached like that in any of our churches today, they would buy him a one-way Greyhound bus ticket and say, we'll see you later, pal. The wilderness is the right place for you. <laughs> Why are these people there and why are they listening? Because what's going on in their world, the political corruptions 
and the dire poverty and the hunger that's due to relentless taxation and all the state-sanctioned violence and executions and all of the hatred and the prejudice and all of the vileness that is in their world, they are looking up and they're saying, these old ways have got to die. They're more than ready for that. It just isn't working anymore. It hasn't worked for a long, long time because it's been 500 years since Malachi talked about some of the same things. So John's followers ask, what should we do? And his answer sounds a whole lot like a certain rabbi that he's about to baptize about 14 verses down. <laughs> he says, you've got to share with everybody who's in need. You've got to be fair with people. You've got to be honest. You've got to guard your integrity. And, that, and that's how this all helps us know why John is not in Jerusalem. It's simple why he's not there. He's not interested in stale rituals and rickety hierarchies. John is just all about justice. The behaviors he called for embody the spirit of Isaiah. Justice is what lifts the valleys and causes mountains to tumble. Justice is what rights crooked paths and makes rough roads smooth. Justice is what makes God visible in the world. We can do, I love the liturgy because we're in the same mind with this. Let's take John up a couple notches. Justice is what puts feet to our prayers and puts us in the caravans of homeless people and refugees who are seeking shelter from the storms of hatred and violence. Justice is what puts urgency in our spirits to end the onslaught of death with gun violence and opioid addiction. Justice is what rises in our voices when we boldly join outcries against sexual predation and discrimination and racism and hatred and all the other things that make us weary. And quite often doing the hard work of justice entails doing the hard work of letting old ways die. So Jesus is coming. That's the banner headline of Advent. That's the breaking news. Amen? Amen. And a lot of times we get worked up in Advent because we are caught in the world. Right? And we just want to put Advent on the parallel path with getting Santa Claus down the chimney, getting all the presents. Advent just kind of gets caught in that mix, that rush mix. And we say we're waiting, but we're rushing. Advent was originally meant to be a little Lent, a little time of consecration, of reevaluation, of getting your heart ready to receive this promise of God. So as we prepare to celebrate the first advent of Christ in a lowly manger, as we anticipate the second advent of Christ in glory, I pray that we also will not forget that Christ comes to us again and again and again, day after day, hour by hour, every time we need Him, Jesus is there. That's where the peace is. It's in those moments when the presence of Christ is, makes itself known in our lives, and when the peace of Christ quells our spirits, that we can take a fresh look at our lives and prayerfully ask, what needs to be kept? And what are the old ways that need to die? And I can't answer that question for you. You have to answer that question for yourself. But there's an old, great gospel song. And you know I come from that community, so you know that's going to be a gospel song. Here somewhere. <laughs> there's an old, great gospel song that says it better than I ever could. It says, search me, Lord. Search me, Lord. Turn the light from heaven on my soul. If you find anything that shouldn't be, take it out. Strengthen me. I want to be right. I want to be saved. I've got to be whole.